So next slide. So this is a three-year project, um, includes partners in Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Uh, it's funded um, by a forest service grant, and we're just rolling into the third year of the grant uh, now um, after pivoting and moving a lot of activities uh, online uh, due to COVID, of course, over the past 18 months. Activities associated with the project, um, but an important part uh, outreach and engagement. And there are two uh, parallel tracks of uh, working to reach foresters and other natural resource professionals, uh, as well as landowners, because they are two uh, very important target audiences uh, in the region for this work. Here are our partners. Uh, the Forest Stewards Guild uh, is the lead partner in grant recipient. Um, but we have other essential partners in the state agencies, Massachusetts DCR, um, Mass Wildlife, Connecticut Deep, and uh, Rhode Island uh, DEM, um, without whom uh, this project uh, wouldn't have happened. The Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station um, is playing a key role in the research and um, demonstration parts of this project. And uh, we're also working with the organizations um, that have direct ties you know, with landowners in the three states um, so we can uh, reach as many people as possible. And here are the four uh, main goals of the project. Uh, in the end, you know, we do want to increase the on the ground forest stewardship activities uh, that are going to support uh, oak resilience and promote that on the landscape. And with the webinar uh, today, we're really focusing on the second goal, which is reaching, reaching natural resource professionals and trying to give them the information, the tools, and you know, resources that you need um, for getting up to speed on uh, assessing current oak forest health issues and thinking about um, you know, where to go from there and addressing them. Thirdly, um, we also want to build landowner awareness um, on this topic, um, make them more aware of some of the challenges um, and importantly, uh, possible solutions uh, and ways to address these issues. And then, of course, Southern New England's a relatively small region, you know, with three different states. Um, and we want to foster, you know, collaboration um, among the the different agencies working on this landscape uh, and many different organizations. Um, so we can be working on this together uh, across state lines and building long lasting partnerships uh, that can have a greater collective impact uh, than if we were all working you know, individually in our different corners of the region. So some people might ask, you know, why all this focus on oak? Uh, Southern New England forests are after all, uh, known for their diversity of tree species, uh, but it's important to point out that fully 70% of the region's forests are dominated by oaks, um, even as there are many other species present. Um, and there are several different oak species within the region, and uh, this forest type is under stress because uh, they're facing pressures that compromise their long-term health and ability to regenerate. And some of these threats uh, include heavy deer browsing, uh, there's defoliation from both native and exotic insect pests, and then uh, more recently we have you know, trends of seasonal, seasonal drought and climate change pressures uh, that compound these disturbance factors. It's not an easy social environment for practicing forestry. Uh, of course it's densely settled, and not everyone uh, understands or supports the need for cutting some trees um, <clears throat> to sustainably manage forests. Um, and you know, in some parts of the region, you know, you know, particularly along um, the Connecticut Rhode Island border and in South Central Massachusetts, uh, they've seen areas of widespread canopy mortality, um, and this you know impacts. You know, wildlife species that depend on oaks for food and habitat uh, causes you know, hazards in residential areas and along roadsides. 
And it's you know, dealt a significant financial blow to some landowners who've invested for years uh, in tending to you know, growing you know, quality timber trees, uh, only to uh, see them die over a relatively short period of time. And amid all these threats, um, <clears throat> there are silvicultural approaches that are developed in the 20th century and uh, worked for a long time. Um, but you know, we're seeing evidence that, that now some of these are failing to secure healthy oak regeneration and uh, some new approaches are clearly needed. And, uh, you know, working on this landscape, uh, you know, working with private landowners uh, is essential because they control, you know, 80% of the forest in the region, um, even though there are um, important you know, public land holdings, you know, such as the um, Quabbin Reservation, which we'll be uh, visiting next week. Um, there's you know, not too much um, private land you know, owned by corporate owners in Southern New England. It's mostly families and individuals uh, who don't tend to own you know, relatively small parcels compared to the rest of the country, uh, as many of you know. And they're the primary decision makers um, uh, for their land. Uh, so the, the decisions that they make are going to affect, you know, the outcomes that we see on this landscape uh, for decades to come. And along with private landowners, um, forestry professionals, um, who I suspect you know, make up the, the bulk of our uh, audience this afternoon, are critically important partners as well uh, for your role in working with these landowners in helping make them aware of all the issues uh, on their woodlands and helping connect them with some of the technical resources or funding that they may need to help address them to maintain the health of their forests um, and indeed keep their lands you know, forested uh, into the future. And towards that end, um, a big part of this project uh, over the past year has been developing an oak resiliency assessment tool, uh, which is primarily intended for foresters uh, and other professionals. This is a website based tool that you can use in the office or uh, out in the field uh, on your smartphone. And the Forest Stewards Guild you know, worked on this. Uh, we could not have done it without our uh, partners with the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative and the Northern Institute for Applied Climate Science. Um, but it's, it's intended to assess the vulnerability and adaptive capacity of uh, a forest parcel or a smaller area of a, of a larger forest. And uh, the user uh, will you know, respond you know, to a number of, of questions you know, about the condition of the forest that you can do when you're out there in the field um, or thinking of it when you're back in the office. And after you enter the responses, the tool will crunch the numbers as it were and you know, come back with a, with a report uh, that shows uh, where that forest area and how it compares in terms of vulnerability and adaptive capacity uh, compared to similar oak forests. And it'll also suggest some possible management approaches uh, without being too prescriptive. And uh, there are a lot more you know, resources and references on specific issues such as um, dealing with severe weather events, um, invasive species or uh, deer browse, for example. There will be uh, opportunities to learn more and get trained up on using this tool uh, over the coming year. And finally, I want to bring your attention uh, to this uh, insect, uh, which I believe is you know, familiar to all of us, um, you know, that we, we learned as the gypsy moth of uh, this past summer, the Entomological Society of America, uh, along with its European counterpart, uh, officially retired this name uh, because of you know, feedback that was received uh, worldwide. Uh, the term is considered offensive to the Romani people, who are the largest ethnic minority group uh, in Europe. And as part of their Better Common Names project, uh, they're um, going to be coining a new 
name for this insect. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll refer to it by its Latin name, which is Lamentria dispar, um, or the dips, dispar moth uh, for the rest of this webinar and during the club and field tour next week. And we hope that that's something that you may all consider in your day-to-day -day work as well. And from here, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Audrey Barker Plotkin. She is a Massachusetts licensed forester, uh, a researcher at the Harvard Forest, and a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts. And I'm excited to learn more about her work. Thanks, Audrey. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for queuing this up. And you know, I'm really glad that there's a nice crowd in the room. I'm going to focus on oak response to defoliation in central Massachusetts, this recent outbreak of Lymatria dispar that we've experienced. Um, and so broadly, my research program focuses on forest response to disturbances, and I'm, I'm also especially interested in oak because it's such a powerhouse of our forest. And I recently had the opportunity to initiate some new work looking at oak response to this recent defoliation event and focusing in on central Massachusetts. Oops, all right. So of course, this involves a ton of collaborators and funding sources, including um, researchers from University of Massachusetts, Boston University, Wellesley College, Quabbin Forestry, University of Connecticut, and lots of undergraduates. And our funding, we have funding through the National Science Foundation. This work is part of our, the Harvard Forest Long-Term Ecological Research Program. So I just started this work, but I intend to continue it for a very long time. And just to put this into a bigger context, invasive forest insects are a major change, uh, a major global change driver. Um, they can eliminate an entire spe uh, tree species, which is both, uh, which is really alarming. Although for my nerdy ecological uh, science side, it's also a really fascinating ecological story to unravel. Um, and of course they have long-term effects on forest composition and productivity. And the Northeastern US is an invasion hotspot for these forest pests. So this is from 2015, so the numbers are probably a, a bit higher now. But um, this shows the number of invasive forest pests in every state in the lower 48. And you can see that uh, southern New England is solidly in that red zone. And I, you know, that's really driven by a combination of um, the region being a hub for global trade, where most of these uh, pests come in, as well as our you know, extensive forest cover. So one of the more famous of these invasive forest pests is Lymantria dispar. And it's been here for more than 100 years. We often don't know the history of you know, how a specific insect got here, but we do for, for uh, Lymantria. I'm just going to call it Lymantria um, throughout the rest of this presentation. It's, uh, we can blame it on this guy, Etienne Leopold Truvela. Um, he was an amateur entomologist living in Medford, Massachusetts, and he brought Lymantria to his home um, as part of a, a silk moth breeding program. Not only did that fail, but the, uh, the caterpillars got out of his window and started eating the leaves in his neighborhood. Maybe not coincidentally, he moved back to France uh, not long after that and uh, became more um, of an amateur astronomer rather than an entomologist after that experience. But anyways, since then, uh, the range of this insect has spread quite a lot. So it's, it's really pervasive throughout New England. And you know, along the current invasion front, there are active slow the spread campaigns from coordinated at the federal level. So just, you know, here's what the insect looks like. Here's the adult egg mass and caterpillars. And if you've been in the region, you know, in the last five years, you're probably very familiar with these. Um, so I guess, you know, the thing 
I wanted to say about, it's been here for a long time, so it's well established. Our forests have experienced periodic outbreaks of Lymantria for the past hundred years. But we got somewhat complacent um, in part because we haven't had a major outbreak for quite a while. And that is in part because uh, in 1989, this introduced fungal pathogen became established. It's specific to gypsy moth, Lymantria. And you can see the fungus um, on this dead caterpillar. And it's really good at keeping um, the insect populations out of outbreak mode, but not it's not foolproof. And so what we experienced um, focused around 2016 to 2018 was a major Lymantria outbreak that defoliated you know, thousands of acres in Southern New England and ended up killing you know, thousands and thousands of oak trees primarily. So I got to jump in kind of at the end of the outbreak um, um, and add this to my research program and really get at some basic questions. What are the patterns and predictors of mortality? So, you know, first of all, what was the pattern of mortality in central Massachusetts? And so this is Southern New England. Um, my study region is the gold rectangle. And then digging in a bit more on what tree level and site level factors predict oak mortality risk. And those include things like tree size, how much sun they get, um, what species they are, what are their stored energy reserves, you know, things like that. And then site level factors, like at the site level, how much oak dominance is there, just how severe was the defoliation and, uh, other site conditions like soil and slope. So to get at the first question, this is primarily um, work by my collaborator, Val Pascarella. She's at Boston University and she's a remote sensing um, wizard, I'll say. Um, so what she did was develop a, a method using Landsat, Landsat satellite data to estimate change in cover, which is a proxy for you know, defoliation. She put this together and I worked with her on some ground validation that we published in the last year. I've got links to the publications if you want to nerd out and read those. Um, so this shows that, you know, in this, so here's the quabbin, um, here's Amherst. So it's, you know, kind of zooming right in, but you can see in that area, 2016 was not widespread, but pretty bad in a few places. 2017 was the most widespread defoliation with real hotspots in the Northeast Quabbin, and this is the Holyoke Range. And then in 2018, it started to you know, calm down, but there were still some really badly defoliated areas. And then in 2019, um, the outbreak pretty much collapsed. There was a really wet spring and the caterpillars never really got off the ground or uh, off the tree, I guess. So using, um, based on those changing condition maps, we selected 10 sites and areas uh, that varied in how many years they were defoliated. So we focused in on this Northeastern area of the Quabbin, and this is where we're gonna be going, for those of you going on the um, field tour next week, we'll be going right in this area and visiting this plot actually. Um, so we set up plots that uh, were defoliated just once, two years in a row, and a couple that were defoliated three years in a row. And just, you know, to get one thing squared away, you know, Lymantria is a generalist feeder, but in this area, oak is by far its preferred host. So in terms of the mortality that we observed, um, we have across these plots, nearly 40% of the oaks died, whereas only 8% of all other tree species died. And before I get into results, here are just some photos of all the fun we had in the field, collecting data on the trees, we collected caterpillars, and this is, I'll get into this later, collecting wood samples for um, 
to look at their sugar and starch concentrations as a measure of energy reserves. So one basic result, this is just looking at um, how much biomass the plots had before the outbreak and how much of that did they lose to um, the outbreak mortality. So these are arranged and color coded by the number of years defoliated. So not at all, one, two, and three. And this is biomass in the scientific uh, notation of metric tons per hectare. Um, so as you would expect, the more, you know, the more years that a tree, that a site is defoliated, the more mortality loss of biomass you get. And so, you know, it's pretty well known that most oaks can survive one year of defoliation. So we only saw 12% um, biomass loss in those plots. After two years of defoliation, it rose to about a quarter of the biomass. And when you got to three years of defoliation, it was super, you know, it was really severe, more than half. So we're going to be following those trees over the long term. Um, we'll be doing, a, we've been doing canopy health assessments annually since 2019. And in 2024, so five years after we set things up, we'll be going back and getting a um, you know, comprehensive picture of how these sites are responding over a longer period of time. And I'm really into long-term plots. So you know, my intention is, you know, as long as the club is happy to host me, I want to, you know, keep these for decades. Um, one thing that we did look at sort of as a, you know, prospectus looking ahead, you know, this is just after mortality. So this is not the full story on tree regeneration, but we did do a survey in 2020 of the tree saplings in the site. So those are ones that are more than chest height, but uh, less than five centimeters diameter. And across our 10 sites, we observed 16 different tree species um, with a few of those being abundant. So, and I'm saying abundant is 100 stems per hectare, which is about 40 per acre. Um, white pine and black birch were frequently abundant. Uh, there were some sites that had yellow birch, hemlock, chestnut, or red maple, and a couple, of, and you know, one site each where of 10, where sugar maple and beech became important in the mix. Sadly, since we're all here because we love oak, um, oak saplings were only present in two sites and below that 100 cents per hectare threshold. However, it's, you know, if they grow well and can get into the canopy, I think they can. Uh, contribute to the new forest canopy. And then, you know, and again, this is not the full story because regeneration will be developing over the next, you know, decade or so. So I'm going to pivot a little bit to a more detailed question that um, you might think is kind of an obvious question to ask, which is why do defoliated trees die? And one explanation that seems very plausible is that they die because they run out of energy reserves, which are sugars and starches. So when trees photosynthesize, they, um, they take some of that and use it for immediate energy needs. They put some into growth. That's how you get the tree bigger. Um, and then some of it is stored, um, especially in the uh, stems and roots. And that's really important for stressful times and to just kind of run the tree. Um, so the idea is that as you get more severe defoliation, you start to drain those energy reserves. So the two kind of seemingly obvious hypotheses I asked were, or proposed were that carbon stores, these sugars and starches decrease with the foliation frequency and severity. And that there's a critical threshold, like if you get into this danger zone below a certain amount of these energy stores, then a tree will die. Um, and you know, based on 
what I've read in the literature. There's some support for this, but it's actually pretty, it's kind of a hot topic in physiological ecology right now. Okay. So I'm not gonna go through the methods. I'm just gonna give a shout out to my amazing collaborator, Megan Bloomstein, who knows how to do this protocol and really helped uh, make this happen. So we, what we did is we sampled 84 oaks in you know, right after we had assessed their defoliation amount in the uh, growing season of 2018, we measured the stored carbon after that, and then a year later to see if there was any recovery. And we sampled trees in some of those plots at the Quabbin, so interior forest, but we also sampled some in forest edges, these roadsides and hedgerows in and around Amherst, Massachusetts. These were trees that Joe Elkington's lab um, set up. Yes, and then Megan did all of this stuff. <laughs> so moving on to the results. So yeah, we found good support for our hypotheses actually. So I'll walk you through this. This is um, a tree level assessment of how much the tree was defoliated in 2018. And then the y-axis, it says total NSC, which is total non-structural carbohydrates, which is just the total sugars and starches the tree has um, in their reserve stock. And so it's, you know, there's a lot of variation, but a really clear trend that as you get more, defoli more severely defoliated, those uh, carbon stores are drawn down. And um, so this is for the interior, these green dots are for the interior forest trees. We did still see a significant pa pattern for the forest edge trees, but it was much weaker and not entirely sure what the, you know, what the causality is for that. It's possible that prior to 2018, the defoliation may have been a little less in these forest edge trees. Um, it, those are hard to tell from the Landsat data because they're on edges. But, um, but I also think a reasonable explanation is that these forest edge trees, you know, they get more sun and they just have more, um, more capacity to be resilient to defoliation without drawing down their reserves. So that's intriguing and something I'd love to explore more. So last graph here. Um, Oh, maybe not, but last fancy graph. Um, this is showing for the two sites um, where, you know, where that death threshold is. So the, the closed circles are trees that lived, the open circles are trees that died. And these are samples from the root or the stem. And across the board, either site, um, either stem or root, there is a clearly that, um, there's this threshold of 1.5% dry weight of sugars and starches were the only trees that died. So we did see this critical threshold. So that's super interesting. And that's this you know, really interesting deep dive into proximal cause of death. Um, but I just wanna put these results into context that you know, tree mortality is the process. So, and this is a, a model that's been around for decades that I just sort of drew my ideas about how, how it might work for oak. So you start with a healthy tree um, and then there's these predisposing factors that might make you more uh, vulnerable to stresses. And those can include things like that I've already collected data on like tree size, species, uh, competitive environment, site conditions, and I have some tree core data that I can look at re recent growth and tree age and see if those matter too. It's great, this mortality spiral, there are ways out. You might improve your competitive position, for example, if, if there's a thinning. Um, but if you keep going down the spiral, there are these sort of predisposing uh, stresses. Uh, for example, late frost or drought. And we know that there was a pretty bad drought here in 2016 that may have made the response um, to the subsequent defoliation worse. Again, you can improve, but if you don't, and let's say there's a Lymantria outbreak, get defoliation. We know that one year is usually okay for trees. 
so they can put on a new flush of leaves and improve. But if that keeps going on, that's gonna push you closer and closer to the death end of the spiral. There's potential to recover with some canopy dieback, but you might die directly of carbon starvation if your energy reserves go all the way down. And then we also know that there are these secondary organisms, usually innocuous, like two-lined chestnut borer, shoestring fungus, that can really be the death now. So that's just saying that you know, mortality is actually complicated and um, you know, more than one causal factor. So just to wrap up, why does this matter? Well, you know this, oak is awesome. It's a really important timber species. It's really important for habitat. It produces hard mast and it's a big tree. So this is a 141 centimeter red oak out in pepperal mass. And, you know, that large size, it's, it's such a, you know, it's a big storage place for carbon. And just, you know, adds to the structure and size diversity of our forest, which is super needed. We also know that oak is declining. There's, you know, a well-known problem with regeneration, which may have something to do with changing fire regimes, harvest, timber harvest regimes, climate change, and, you know, these insect outbreaks. So I'm going to leave you with, like, something that has no data support, but I just wanted to bring it up. Um, so I put together the um, forest inventory and analysis, just very basic state level for Massachusetts, um, relative growing stock by volume, going back to the 50s. So going back through all of those sort of publication reports. And here's red oak is this orange curve. And you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was the dominant but that's really declined in the last few decades. Um, and, you know, with, with increases in red maple and white pine. Um, and I just overlaid years where more than half a million acres were defoliated in Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, there's nothing I can say about, you know, what, what did this big outbreak in the 80s do did it have something to do with this decline? But it is intriguing, and I would love to you know, find ways to investigate that more thoroughly. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And um, I think Logan's putting together links, and there's you know, here are some ways that you can dig into this more if you're interested. So thank you. And I'm going to pass this on now to Emma Sass. So I've known Emma for a bunch of years. She's a research fellow at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and part of the Family Forest Research Center. She studies private forest landowners in the US. And uh, she has a master's degree from University of Vermont. And she'll be talking about a recent study of family forest owners in the eastern and central U.S. and their thoughts on oak trees and oak management. So take it away, Emma. Great, thanks, Audrey. Um, that was really interesting. And yeah, it's great to be here with everybody today. Um, so as, I mean, as we all know, and as Christopher mentioned explicitly, um, so much of the forest in our area is owned by family, families and individuals, um, family forest owners. So um, as part of thinking about oak on the landscape, we wanted to dig into what are landowners' thoughts on upland oak. Um, and this project is part of, um, was supported by the White Oak Initiative out of the American Forest Foundation, um, as well as other collaborators. So yeah, I'm excited to share kind of a broad overview of the project and some of our, of our findings. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, so the main two questions we wanted to dig into are what are landowner perceptions on the benefits of oak forests um, and specifically they were looking at upland oak forests um, and then what are the barriers to sustainably managing these forests um, so the white oak initiative is interested in kind of the historic range of upland oak um, shown here which includes southern new england so i think it's really kind of an interesting overlap to this conversation um, so we contacted families and individuals who own 10 or more acres of wooded land across this area. 
We contacted 20,000 landowners um, and got about 1,500 responses. I'm happy to talk more about the survey methods, um, but that's kind of the broad overview um, of the scope. You can go to the next. Um, so I want to jump into the results uh, and one of the major findings, and it's not surprising, but landowners like oak and they don't know that it's at risk. We asked a series of, um, we offered a series of statements and asked landowners if they agreed or disagreed um, or didn't know for each statement. So on the bottom, we can see that we asked um, about a, seri a, a series of positive characteristics of oak forests. So they provide scenery, they provide game habitat. Ha habitat, non-game habitat, they provide quality timber, they provide recreational opportunities. We also um, included the statement that oaks are at risk of decline um, and they're at risk of disease, they're at risk of fire. Um, so we'll go to the next. I just wanna highlight that people responded really positively to these positive characteristics of oak forests. Um, the vast majority agreed or strongly agreed that oak forests provide all these great traits. Um, but interestingly, only about a third of, uh, of family forest owners uh, agree that oak is at risk of decline. About a quarter don't know and the rest are somewhere in the middle. Um, so I think there's an interesting gap between like this, these really charismatic, charismatic species um, and kind of not, not knowing the risk that's out there. We also asked if people want more oak on their wooded land uh, and about four out of 10 said yes, which is really exciting. I mean, it's a charismatic species who doesn't want more oak, um, but specifically on their wooded land, um, which was great to see. Um, the people who wanted more oak on their wooded land were more likely to know that oak is at risk of declining. Uh, and they were more likely to have larger wooded acreages and to agree with more of the positive statements about oak. And the last thing that I want to talk about for the results um, are barriers to management. And I think we're all here because oak management is um, can mean a lot of different things, can be really complicated and, um, and look differently on the ground. So we tried to break it down into some of the component management practices. So we asked specifically about um, barriers to harvesting, to planting, to using herbicides, and to using prescribed fire. Um, and I know that's a terrible oversimplification, um, but trying to get at what are some of the barriers that landowners face to doing these practices, hoping that if we can overcome these barriers, they might be able to implement them towards oak management. Um, so there's different barriers, of course, to each to each practice, but um, some of the, of the or two of the, the themes that kept coming up for each practice, I'm going to go to the next uh, slide was thanks was the lack of information and the lack of need so the barriers that they face um, but just not knowing enough about these management practices um, and not perceiving a need for them which i think is really interesting if landowners are you know they want more oak on their wooded land but don't see the connection to how these management practices could support something that they, they might want on their wooded land um so overall i just want to kind of wrap up um with the overall take home that landowners want oak on their wooded land, or many of them do, um, and that overall there's this really positive association with oak forests, which again is not surprising, but it's kind of nice to see reflected across the landscape. Um, it's interesting that there seems to be a low awareness that oaks are at risk of declining, but that the landowners who know that oaks are at risk are more likely to want more oaks on their own property and to, to increase the oaks on their land. Um, and that these kind of barriers that come up again um, are the lack of information and a lack of perceived need, which I think highlights, um, again, what Christopher was talking about in the beginning about this connection between um, being able to share you know, resources and support um, and information with landowners. Um, and so it's really great to be able to be here and talk about some of these, these topics. Um, and I think that's kind of where I wanna leave this. Um, sorry, that was a whirlwind, but uh, I'm gonna pass it along to, um, another kind of landowners. So not just, as we've mentioned before, not just um, families and individuals. Uh, we're gonna pass it to Rich McLean, who's a forester too for the uh, Quabbin Reservoir. And we'll talk to us about um, more about the Quabbin Reservoir uh, and other management, <laughs> management dynamics there. So Rich, if you want to take it away, thanks. Hi, I'm Rich McLean. I'm here to give you uh brief introduction to the Quabbin Reservoir and why we find oak so important to its function. Next slide, please. 
So the Quaman is one of the largest unfiltered drinking water supplies in the U.S. You can see in the below figure the communities inside the dotted orange line. Three million people are drawing their drinking water from the Quaman. The watershed surrounding the reservoir is 73% forested and 91% of the watershed is in protected acreage. And most of the difference in those numbers comes from the 39 square miles covered by the reservoir itself. Uh, the Quadman, instead of having a large mechanical filtration plant, provides high quality drinking water thanks to its forest filter. And that forest is composed of primarily even age stands established around the agricultural abandonment of the late 19th and early 20th century and the establishment of the Quadman Reservoir itself. These forests have been actively managed for centuries, but most recently have been managed by the state agencies responsible for the Quadman. That management started with the planting of plantations to help accelerate the conversion of uh, former agricultural fields into forest cover, and then continued with small scale forestry, like uh, harvest by previous landowners around the establishment of the Quabbin and salvage operations after the 1938 hurricane. The forestry here continued with the formalization of a forestry program in the early 1960s with the hiring of Quabbin's second forester, its first management plan, and the establishment of a continuous forest inventory system that continues to this day. Shortly after, the silvicultural goals transitioned into forest improvement practices and water yield with water yield uh, focused mostly on the conversion of non-native plantations into native forest species. With improvements in the water delivery system and the aging of our forests, in 1995, uh, a management plan uh, introduced our current goal, and that is to improve our forest disturbance resiliency through increased age and species diversity which we mostly accomplish through regeneration silviculture. Here looking at a mean quabbin acre from our 2020-2021 CFI, we can see why we find oak to be so important for our watershed focus or for our watershed forests. Oaks are nearly a third of our mean basal area with northern red oak providing nearly a quarter. Uh, most of our oaks, especially northern red oak and white oak, are long-lived, deep-rooting, and tend to be more wind firm, meaning they're more resistant to the primary disturbance agent of the area, which is windstorms. They're mass-producing. I mean, one thing that you'll notice is missing in that uh, breakdown of our species assemblage is beech and chestnut. So oaks are our primary mass-producing species. They also have high economic value and a host of other ecosystem services. So they're one of our keystone species. We also know that they're facing multiple issues. Uh, like much of the region, we're experiencing issues with um, regeneration of oak, uh, especially at Quabbin, where there was a 50 year period without any deer control until uh, hunting was reintroduced in 1991. And just as our deer population numbers started reaching healthy levels, we saw moose re-establish themselves and introduce a whole new browse pressure. In 1981 and 2016, we had the land entry of disbar outbreaks and the widespread mortality related to them. And then there's a host of other novel mortality agents on the horizon, uh, such as sudden oak death which is why the research that we saw today is so important in helping inform how we continue to manage our forests uh, to provide the high quality drinking water to the communities that rely on us. Thanks. Great, thank you everyone, uh, Rich, Emma, Audrey and Christopher, um, I appreciate all the all the insights that you shared with us. Um, a reminder to participants: if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the in the chat window. Um, and I'll start with the one Christopher asked um, for Audrey. I was interested in your graphs based on data from FIA and state agency level CFI plots. Do you think there could be opportunities to use data from CFI plots for a research study related to oak forest health? 
Yeah, definitely. I feel like compiling and digging into those is the is the key challenge. But you know, obviously that the Quabin plots go back to the '60s, and that's you know that's the treasure trove um, that would be super useful. Um, and then I think that you know, like right now, a lot of the bigger um, like the forest inventory and analysis plots, since they started their, you know, sort of re, their sort of new method, a lot of people analyze the data just back to the early 2000s, but that's not long enough to really look at, for, look for trends. But I would, yeah, I would love to compile um, plot data that go back, you know, ideally to at least the 70s so we can get, you know, before and after that big Lymantria outbreak in the, in 81. Great, thank you. And uh, you can stop sharing the screen now. And I think I may have turned off your camera on accident as I was trying to spotlight folks. Um, I, I also have a question for you. Um, on the slide that showed the biomass declines after defoliation events, um, the most drastic loss occurred after the third defoliation. Um, and one of those sites already had the lowest amount of biomass. Um, is there anything that predisposes those sites to repeated defoliation events or um, is it just out of coincidence? I, I am not sure. I mean, I think, yes, that there are things that can predispose um, sites to defoliation, and I'm not entirely sure, you know, that's part of what I'm trying to figure out, I guess. So that's, that is, uh, keep, stay tuned. Great. Um, and I have a question from Mark Doherty. Um, are there any early Lymantria detection methods for landowners? And I'll look to Christopher, Audrey, and Emma for, for insights onto this one. Well, I'd say there's no substitute for, you know, getting out there and, and you know, walking your land and, you know, being aware of, of, of you know, trends. Uh, that's, you know, pretty old fashioned low tech. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that could, you know, could be combined with, you know, remote sensing that, but that's, that's more of the, you know, federal and state agency level. Yeah, I would say hopefully some of these um, defoliation, you know, satellite based defoliation maps can be made more available to landowners. So, you know, that's, it's of course after the fact, but you could see, oh, it looks like there's something brewing, you know, to the to the southeast of me. I should keep a close eye. I think that would be useful. And then another tried and true method is in the autumn, you can do uh, egg mass surveys specifically for Lymantria um, and look for those. And that it doesn't always, you know, tell you if there's if, but if you, you know, if you don't see a lot of egg masses, that's good. If you see a lot of egg masses, that means that you should be more um, keeping a closer eye. Great. Emma, anything you want to add to early detection for landowners? No, I think both of those are really good points. Great. Um, and I got another one directed for Audrey and it just ran away from me. Um, the biomass loss you referred to was uh, just the live biomass, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So the kind of the grayed out bars were the, you know, the part that's now dead. So yeah, certainly um, including estimates of dead wood mass and volume is, is important, but this focused on just the live component. Great, thank you. Um, this next one could get uh, could get long. Um, Rich, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your sustainable forestry practices, regen silviculture, age for securing adequate seedlings per acre, rotation age or cutting cycle length um, with red oak on Quabbin, or will we see and discuss that next week? Like you said, that gets to be a, a long and complicated discussion. It's probably best served by having that next week. Um, if for no other reason, then we'll have a host of other folks responsible for forestry at Quabbin. Great, thank you. Uh, this one's for Emma from Amanda. Um, the barriers to action were interesting. Do you have thoughts on what activities might help landowners overcome some of those barriers? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, that, that is the next question, right? And I feel like we don't have a good answer beyond like the normal things that we think about. So we know that like the 
an engagement with a natural resource professional or like the in-person walking the land is so critical, but also that people really respond, often respond well to like written materials or um, just general information. Um, so I feel like there's a big opportunity for that, but I don't think we have a good sense of either for Oak specifically or um, yeah, I like that's kind of an ongoing question, but I, I feel like any information is good. And I, yeah, in terms of what's the most effective or um, kind of targeted is, is ongoing. And I would love to, to dig more into that and kind of keep having conversations about that. Great, thank you. Um, this one seems uh, more in general. Um, we all like oak, but if there are fewer acorns, would that allow the deer population to decrease to more tolerable levels? I think that's, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if anybody feels uh, comfortable answering that one. I don't, don't have a, a definitive answer to, to, to that one, but you know, have, have to you know, think about how you know, acorns are you know, valuable uh, you know, food for, you know, many different, different species in, in addition to deer that we want to have on the landscape. And um, those of us who've, you know, spent a lot of time working in the woods and, you know, know how they um, really love, you know, eating oak foliage too. And, and that's a, a staple of their diets. And maybe that's one of their uh, favorite foods, you know, one of the most delectable species, uh, but they're a, a very, you know, versatile and adaptable animal. And they'll, um, as they're, they're hungry, they'll, they'll go, you know, right, right down the, the, the species that are available from their most preferred to when they, you know, start um, even, you know, browsing on pine or um, beech or, or other, other species. And I think, you know, I think to manage the deer population, you know, do need to take into account um, other factors and methods. Great, thank you, Christopher. Uh, this next one's for Audrey. Um, have you looked at the utility of the concepts of susceptibility to defoliation and vulnerability to mortality that is in the literature from the 1980s and 90s? Yeah, I've definitely thought about that, you know, like how likely is, you know, how likely are, is the insect to affect a tree versus kill a tree? Yeah, and I, um, I'm not sure who, Ask that question, but if you have any specific literature in mind, I've definitely read like, you know, a lot of literature from the 80s um, and before. But if there's specific things that you want to point my way, I, I would love to find out more from you. Great, thank you. Uh, this next one's for Rich. Um, for those of us who can't attend next week, uh, could you say a word or two about your civil culture? And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe just highlighting the uh, two sites that we'll look at um, on the field tour would be best. So a very brief overview is that we are looking to um, have a roughly 1% of our acreage uh, harvested on an annual basis to try and achieve, a, you know, around a 100 year rotation of our manageable acreage. Um, we are very careful about um, placing uh, where our harvests are occurring so that we're not ever harvesting more than 25% of our subwatersheds in any 10 year period. Um, based off of, you know, previous watershed forestry research. And our standard silviculture is usually uh, uh, some form of group selection, ranging from a uh, half acre to two acre uh, group openings with retention, uh, with some exceptions around uh, plantation conversion where we'll have large openings. Um, in terms of oak, uh, we are beginning to look into um, some alternative um, options for trying to encourage oak regeneration. We just established an oak slash wall in the Ware River watershed, which is next door to Quabbin. And uh, we have, in partnership with Mass Wildlife, been looking at uh, using fire as um, more of a silvicultural tool uh, in our watershed.
Great, thank you, Rich. Um, uh, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Um, Colin says, uh, recently saw programs in Pennsylvania about using intensive and costly efforts to maintain or restore oak, um, such as fire, herbicides, and deer exposures. Rather than allow succession of shade tolerance into uh, what has been more dominantly oak stands, um, so the debate continues. Does anybody have any thoughts on, on that? I think that is you know, something that we're starting to see here in this region of Southern New England, you know, particularly for uh, public landowners who you know, want to see oak retained on, on the landscape and are you know, finding that it's necessary to employ uh, some, of, some of these measures, um, you know, given the lack of regeneration uh, that's that's found in some areas after a traditional shelter with harvest, for example. I think you're you're first starting to see it on uh, public lands. Um, was, you know they they you know may have the budget, have you know professional managers, um, you know, and the you know the resources to do um, some some of these things. Um, well, there may be opportunities for private landowners to do it by you know working with with NRCS, say, or, or another agency. Um, and it is something that this this project is is trying to highlight some of these methods slash goals, for example. Um, but we we certainly you know don't have all the answers. You know while we're trying to you know work towards finding solutions that work together. Great, thank you, Christopher. And one last quick one for Rich: um, Do you do intermediate treatments between groups? So intermediate treatments between the groups is always you know, just going to be uh, determined by what's appropriate for the stand. Great. Thank you very much, um, Christopher, Audrey, Emma, and Rich. Um, this was a really informative webinar, and I'm especially looking forward to the field tour next week. Um, and I wish that everybody could join us, but unfortunately, it will just be a, a group of us. Um, but I hope that those that could only join the webinar today um, took away some key information. Um, for proof of attendance um, for SAF CFE credits, you can email me, and I am... Uh, putting that in the chat now. Um, if you are joining the field tour next week, stay tuned for an email from uh, me or, or our registration system early next week with some logistical details um, for the day. Um, and with that, uh, that concludes our Oak Resiliency Learning Exchange webinar. And I look forward to seeing those of you that will be joining us next week. Thank you.